Okay. Just let me know if the audio goes down any. Okay. You should be live on Facebook now. It looks like it's still setting up the meeting. So I'm gonna wait just a second and then I'm gonna introduce us. And it looks like we are live. All right. Wonderful people on this glorious Sunday evening. It is good to be with you. You know, just pinlock this screen right here. It's good to be with you. For all of those who are tuning in, thank you for tuning in. Happy Sunday to you. And welcome to Meet the Producers here on American Legacy Network. I'm your host this evening. My name is JP Reynolds from American Legacy's Memoir Noir. And tonight I'm stepping in for my brother, R. Joshua Reynolds, who has been take, take care of a last minute responsibility and requires his full attention. So, so I'm here. And I am happy to be with you tonight as we engage with another Meet the Producer session. And I'm excited about tonight, the fellow musician here and another producer over at ALN. Tonight we have Lamont Jack uh, Perley, producer of Talking About the Blues on American Legacy Network, which I hope you've already signed up for. So if you have not signed up for whatever reason, you need to make that happen as soon as this conversation ends. But we're going to be together in conversation right now. And I'm going to read a little bit about Jack, and then we're going to get right into it. Is that good with you? That's good with me, man. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. So just, for, just a little bit about Jack. Jack is an applied folklorist, ethnographer, African-American traditional music historian, and practitioner. He's a historian and a practitioner. He does this thing, too. The founder of Jack Dapper Blues Heritage Preservation Foundation, Lamont, uh, uses his broadcast experience to produce exciting, meaningful, and historically accurate content that explores and highlights African-American traditional music and the Black experience. His latest endeavor, along with his wife, Lamont created, is in, in his publishing the African-American Folklorist newspaper, which is a quarterly print publication that contains articles about traditions, traditional beliefs, the cultural context, geographical locations, music, dance, and vernaculars of the blues people. All of that, all of that mixed up in there. So I am very uh, grateful to be joined tonight with, with Lamont Jack Perley. How you doing over there? I'm, I'm doing good, brother. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. It's wonderful to have you on, and I'm grateful to have this conversation with you. Where are you joining us from? Uh, right now, I'm in Kentucky. You're in Kentucky? Yes, indeed. That's right. I'm, I'm currently in Mount Vernon, New York. So we're going from Kentucky to Mount Vernon, you know, bringing all of the vibes from all of the his history of the land that we're, that we're both standing on, both sitting on right now. Uh, and I want to kind of get right into it. The music producer sessions have been great opportunities for folks to get a better sense of who are the, the, the folks creating the content that is currently on the American Legacy Network as it continues to grow on this land. So, you know, I read your bio, you're a blues man, you're a producer, you're a music man, you're a history man, you <laughs> right in here at ALN. And uh, I would just like you to share with us how you, how you got your start into the industry. How I got my start in the industry? Yeah, go, go back, let's do it. Oh my goodness. <laughs> um, man, me and my uh, brother were, uh, we were the Black Kennedys. We was, I was a mm. rapper, he was my DJ. And, <laughs> um, we used to call it going to the basement and he cook up some boom bap and that's that was the entry uh and uh we did a, a the circuit on the underground scene for a while we we met some great folk and uh had some interesting stories and uh, a lot of those a lot of those brothers and sisters uh helped mold me in one way or another whether they know it or not to get to this point mm. you know but yeah. that, that was really the beginning, you know, um, mm. hip hop was always, I mean, I, I grew up in a household that music was always being played like most of us. And I was babysat by my Fisher Price record player. So <laughs> <laughs> I'll go through my, uh, my pops and my grandpops and my uncle's record collection with my cousin. Mm. And, and that, that's just what, what really started everything. I, I, I listened to uh, Stevie Wonder, Mm. I used to stare at the Temptation album cover because I saw myself in David Ruffin with, you know, wow. dark skin, skinny, 
cat with a little afro and glasses. I was gonna say I can see this. I can see it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, Curtis Mayfield, Smokey Robinson, all these people. Yeah. And, and so by the time you know, all of us in our respectful uh, uh, lanes was and still is, for that matter, hip hop. Mm. And I, I just wanted to create songs that were timeless, like those brothers. And I mean, I'm, I'm, I didn't mean to exclude the women. There were women that was great that I was listening to, you know, Nina Simone, mm. Franklin, mm -hmm. and a couple of few. More, when I say more recent, more in the 90s, like Amel LaRue, people like this. Mm. You yeah. know, she, um, what she showed me was you can be a professional musician and pay your bills and still have a quality of life. You don't have to be plastered all over the place. Mm. Yeah. So, so all these people, uh, Sean Price, uh, Blase, all these people, the mm. Rangers, Wives, Half, and Jerry, all, uh, Runner, all these people mm. um, gave a little bit or, or, and, and taught a lot bit mm. to, to help me get to where I am right now. Yeah. You know? I hear that. Yeah. So, you know, and then, you know, I, I, I um, ended up going back to school for uh, digital media, filmmaking, and broadcasting. Mm. And I, I wanted to take, uh, you know, my goal was always to go from recording to book to film. Mm. Okay. You know, yeah. and, um, and, and a little do as a little guy in school, I wanted to be a journalist, uh, you know, and I petitioned and, and pitched the teacher and, and we got uh, the first school newspaper. However, mm. you know, she didn't think I was suited to be editor or writer. So wow. I ended up being a photographer, which is not a problem. Right. Well, it is a problem, but we're not talking about that part of it. <laughs> right, right. But I mean, it, as being a photographer, that wasn't a problem for me because my uncle always took pictures. My mother, you know, you know, and, and they, they, you know, my people's kind of set me up. Uh, mm. They probably knew it. I didn't know it. You know what I mean? But the different things and activities we did in the house also played a big part into where I am right now. So, yeah. you know, did some films and then uh, got into the broadcast uh, media world. Wow. And then, yeah. And um, I always listened to blues, uh, not as much as the last several years, but it was in my house. You know, my grandparents mm -hmm. on both sides. Mm. And going back and forth to uh, Louisiana as a child and black spirituals specifically mm -hmm. that was always there. Mm -hmm. but, um, I didn't, I didn't take it. I didn't look at it as anything, you know what I mean? It's like, you know, uh, when, when, I, when I got into this space as a folklorist and that's a funny story too. Yeah. I'll get to that in a second. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you, you, I, I'm reading and researching what, um, was considered outsiders mm. are writing about our people. Mm. And, mm -hmm. You know, the first and foremost thing out after I, I get over the how dare they, mm. but they, they were really focusing on things that I actually took advantage of because it was just, just a happenstance, you know, yeah. Friday and Sunday nights, yeah. everybody goes to my grandparents' house. That, that wasn't, you know, it was big and fun. It was big because we could see everybody get to play with the cousins, this, that, and the third. Yes. But it, it, it didn't come across as something historical, mm. you know, something to be documented as a uh, tradition. You know, yes. So these things were always happening. And when, um, to fast forward it, uh, about 2000, in the 2000s, I don't know, if, I, I don't remember if it was five, 2005 or what have you, but uh, my pops transcended and my mm. grandfather transcended wow. my father within a year. Yeah. So I find myself in Louisiana uh, in a different stage of my life and, mm. and my brother in a different stage of his life. And we, you know, we just had these long conversations driving around Louisiana because we got to go from Harvey back to Norlin and then mm. to Bell Rose. Where mm -hmm. Is, and this is when I find out that the Pearly family has a burial ground next to this mm. church, and this entire town is predominantly my family or someone connected to my family. Wow. 
and you know we're on the dirt road, nice big church, and across the street where they have the uh, repast, mm. it's like a shotgun house almost. Yeah. And you, you know, while everybody's talking, I'm just hearing blues and black spirituals. Mm-hmm. And it just yeah, it, it just so so it, it stemmed from it, it's. I came back mm. asking a lot of questions that I asked as a youth. Wow. But, with a different uh, 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 ground and a different foundation, a different understanding. Wow. And, and the same thing happened when we buried my uh, grandfather on a uh, military base in Virginia. Everybody from Mississippi came up and it's mm. the same thing, you know, same conversation, same music, mm. same feeling. And mm. what ends up happening is I realized that my family literally traveled with this music across the country. Mm. And, and that kind of sparked yeah. where I'm at now and, and diving into blues. Yeah. You know. And just on a side note, I had, you know, there was a lot of things happening in the quote unquote rap scene of, of music. Yes. That, you know, uh you, you get to start uh and in my personal life, you get to start uh, 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 saying to yourself, okay, what am I going to really do with my life? <laughs> mm. I'm going to do this. I have a, a somewhat of a, a writer's block and different things like this. So kind of the, the ancestors during that time I was going through this, I believe, um, set it up that I can go through this so I can get somewhat of a writer's block, so I can experience these different things because what ends up happening is they transmit to me that this is what you're supposed to be doing. So I go out, wow. I buy a banjo, I buy a guitar. Wow. I never played it in my life. Wow. <laughs> and I buy these things and I teach myself how to play and I start looking for wow. and everybody to interview. Right. And here we are today. And so and was this all after you visited or you found out about that plot of land? Yes. Or is this, wow, well, that's a powerful trajectory and to, to get from you know, kind of starting out in the hip hop space and then finding out more about your family and finding out the connection of your family traveling with the music and holding that within them and seeing how that traverse land is incredibly powerful and is a really dope identity and origin story, right? Especially when it comes to your, your life as a musician. And I'm curious as to, uh, you know, which, which connections you found in even those music forms between blues and your kind of origination of hip-hop? Well, um, man, I, that's not even, a, it's not a loaded question, but there's so many answers to that because yeah. what ends up happening is, you, find, you know, as I'm digging into the music, not even just into the history and the traditional, it's just the music, songs that we heard that our parents and grandparents played we probably didn't rec. I know I didn't fully recognize it. I would say it, and oh no, 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 no. But they've been rapping. <laughs> Correct. The song Chuck Berry did in the fifties. He was spitting sixteen right. bars. Yeah. You know, um, we 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 crack on each other, and they call it the dozens back in the seventies and the eighties. Yes. Rap. Yes. Dolomite. Everybody speaks about Dolomite and James Brown, but. That's that's rap. There's there's a a larger connection uh, now getting into traditional and heritage than we we may think because the system, the commercial system, um, does does a good job of putting a wedge between generations. Mm. But there's a, a a huge connection. I mean, blues. And rap, one of the biggest things about blues and hip hop, the whole culture of hip hop, not just rap. Yes. Is, right. Is, I was gonna say, let's break, we, we can break right. it down, but we gonna, I'm gonna let you keep flowing. <laughs> <laughs> right, because we, we have to get that straight. It, 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 but the blues people and hip hop, the biggest connection is these are two expressions formulated by no European inter. Uh, 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 influences outside of systematic oppression or, 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 or outside of mm. lack of resources. Wow, yeah. Right, because when, when you look at hip hop, we, we know how this started. You know, twofold, the lack of resources and the community 
coming together, which on a side note, you know, we, we can't say as a blanket statement, we need everything has to be positive or, or there can't be gangster rap because it started a gang culture. Gangs came together to find another way to settle differences, mm -hmm. you know, outside of, of people dying, getting hurt and going to prison and, and yeah. just kind of help morph this particular uh, 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 tradition. Yeah, and it's likewise with the blues. So, so there's a lot of 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 connection just coming from the people. You know, mm -hmm. going, going to church. You know, we we have similar upbringings. I know your father, a great man. We yes. all grew up in the church. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> you listen to the minister. If he's not singing while he's giving his ministry, he's rapping and he's probably doping and half these cats out here that got record deals. <laughs> You know, so there's a lot of connections, but go ahead, sir. No, yeah, I mean, because well, you're talking about the vernaculars of, of the folk. And, yes, you know, the end of your bio is with the vernacular of the blues people. Yes, and sir. there's all these intersections, there's all these overlaps, there's so many different pieces, you know, and you mentioned two different instruments that you learned when you got it, when you dove more into the blues space, because you mentioned a whole bunch of names, you mentioned different generations, that is a lot of ways what the African-American musical tradition is. There's so many different pieces that are put together and so much ingenuity that is laced together. When you decided, or when you were led to, because it sounds like you were led to follow the blues tradition. When you were led to follow the blues tradition, what, what, what were the sounds that you were hearing? What were the instruments that you knew you had to attach yourself to to honor the blues tradition, because there are certain distinctions between the musical traditions and what the sounds are in those traditions. So I'm curious as to what you were hearing. You mentioned spirituals, you mentioned voices, but I'm curious, I mean, I wanna, I wanna kind of hear a little more about what you pulled out to, to follow the lead on entering into the blues space. First and foremost, voice and cadence of voice, that was the first thing. Yeah. And um, it was uh, surreal because it, it identified to me and explained to me how I morphed into the rap style I, I've been using or, or cultivating the many years my brother and I was um, working on our craft. I, when I heard these I don't want to say heard these voices, but when I when I was when 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 the ancestors tr transmitted to me, mm -hmm. I I heard the cadence in the voice, and and I was this is why. Even though I like this, and this is what I'm trying to do, I always sound like this. So mm -hmm. that's the first thing, and, yeah. and, and then it was instrument, other instruments, out outer instruments, right? Yes. Oh, uh, oh, yeah. I'm glad you said outer instruments. <laughs> Right. Because who I say I, I say it because whenever people ask me what I play, I say I play my voice in my body. Right. And all these instruments that we're talking about in a lot of ways are emulations of our own bodily instruments. So I'm glad you said that, but keep on going. Yes, sir. Uh, the voice and then the guitar was the first thing. I always wanted one since I was a little guy because of Prince. <laughs> and and the, the irony is again leading to this place unconsciously my pops my uncle my grandparents pa used to make you know not make bust mine and my cousin's chops about prince talking about what do you mean prince he got everything from Jimi hendrix uh, right so so this is mm. something right there that's just in by the way conversation yeah so i i you know i get this guitar and and, and i know about prince i know about Jimi hendrix because i went through my pops record collection Yes. You know, I knew about B.B. King because of my grandparents and a couple of others. Everybody knows Chuck Berry, but what ends up mm -hmm. happening is as I'm digging, I'm finding Sun House. You know, I'm finding uh, mm. Charles Patton, Mississippi John Hurt, uh, yeah. Ryan Hopkins, yeah. and, and all the other people that inspired Jimmy, who inspired, inspired uh, 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 Prince. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and when I'm listening to them, and I, I'll stick with Sun House for a moment because he is the, the embodiment to me of, of 
blues people, blues culture, blues tradition, blues heritage, mm. and 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 the way he sings sound like how one of my granddaddy taught. Mm. You know, or, or or their friends and stuff they talk. So as I'm asking questions, and when my mother blessed the dead, she brought to my attention that uh, my grandpa's daddy Dave was his name, and his uh uh main homeboy uh, Uncle Grover, they knew all these cats. Wow, they knew all these cats. You know, yeah. because it was just like you know when we grew up in you know it it wasn't out of the ordinary. To see Buckshot Shorty, or or to see mm-hmm. Steel, or to see one of these guys in in, in a in the hood in the community is the same mm-hmm. way back then, you know. So it was the the voice, the cadence of the voice, because now we got to understand how things were being expressed and why. And and then the instrument really was the guitar and the piano. Those are the two things. The, the two instruments that I really gravitated to. Yeah. Yeah. And you just said something else that made me think about your, your broader contributions to, to media and music and art. You know, you, you have a radio, you're a radio you're producer as well as just an instrument, just an instru- uh, instrument player or just a practitioner. You have all these different kind of academic intellectual inclinations. And I'm wondering, you know, you mentioned your record, you mentioned a record collection a couple times. You mentioned digging in the crates a little bit, hearing things from back in the day and those, those things inspiring you. I'm wondering what you think about and what you feel about the importance of research in terms of living more fully into your passion and more fully into your craft. Um, excuse me. I think, um, that's extremely important. I mean, that that is beyond important. You know, any young man or young woman, and I'm not trying to be chauvinistic, but speaking from a male perspective, the mm-hmm. men in my family, first thing they say, well, how are you doing this? And you don't know nothing about it. You mm-hmm. need to go learn this, so blah, blah. So that was one of the first lessons. Mm-hmm. Now, <clears throat> as an artist, uh, or a, a producer, you know, uh, of, of content, research is, is key on so many levels, right? Yes. Um, just inspiration, trying to find your voice. Most people, I won't, I'll keep it to myself. I didn't, um, Again, listening to David Ruffin, listening to um, Isaac Hayes, Curtis Mathis, Stevie Wonder. Mm-hmm. You know, I go down the list of all these these uh, uh, the great Sly Stone. You know, yes. Listening to these people as a, as a as a child, the only thing I kept saying to myself was, "Wow, I, I want to affect people like this." Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, so then then it becomes, what what, how am I going to transmit this? And, and what's my voice, you know, mm-hmm. which leads into the funny story I told you I was going to share later. Yeah. yeah. I believe it was around the time. So, so a couple of things had happened a few years ago. And I, th- I think what happened was I was reading an article that was discussing black exploitation film. Mm-hmm. And I was livid and insulted. Wow. So I went on a tirade for a few months on Facebook, on my Facebook page. Mm. And because what they were, what, what they were giving their perception of black exploitation films. Mm. Now we know some were not meant, there, there's some, so let, let's just keep it a, a buck. We Even. know a lot of them was menstrual. Yeah, big long history with that. Right, you know, and we can get into that conversation too because I believe a lot of us ha- have misnomers about the, the importance of it, even though in some cases it's grotesque. Mm. But we know a lot of black exploitation fi- uh, films are uh, menstrual. 
Mm-hmm. The issue that I had with the article that it lumped every black film of this era into these things, even if some of them were meant to be, mm-hmm. which negates and omits its yeah. message. Mm-hmm. Right. So I'll use the example. I remember my very first example that I posted because when I read this, I, I, I started researching. Mm-hmm. Right. And I knew all these movies because I watched it as a child. And then I watched it as a teen with my friends, you know, because we just thought it was so funny, you know, Dolomite and all these things. But yeah. the message was very ser- serious. Yeah. Cleopatra Jones, I, I started with. Mm-hmm. Cleopatra Jones was put in a category of black exploitation, right? So in this article, after it gives its perspective, it lists all these films. And then I start looking up what these films are categorized as. And Cleopatra Jones is a six foot, six foot one dark skinned woman with natural hair in the era of male t- testosterone white men films. Mm. This woman is driving a stick shift, which was considered a man's toy. Mm. She's kicking behind and and, and taking checks. And she's not overly (laughs) exploiting her sexuality. I thought that was such a message that putting Mm. that as a black exploitation Mm. was was at at best disrespectful. Mm. So I go on this tirade, finding all these movies and putting it all up and giving it my little um, contextual uh, post. Yeah, it got into music and it got into this, and you know, and as these things were happening, um, Macklemore, I think that's how you say his name. Ah, uh, he wins, right? He the rapper, you're referring to the rapper Macklemore who won the Grammy. Is that what you're referring to? That's exactly what right. I'm referring to, yes, sir. Mm-hmm. When the Grammy makes mm-hmm. a statement about Kendrick Lamar and how yes. hip hop and stuff. I go on my timeline and majority of people in my time, a good percentage because majority of the people in my timeline are black folk in my age group at a give or take five year, my um, minor, 10 year, my elder, the people I grew up with or some mm-hmm. kind of six degree of separation. Right. And they're going crazy. Mm. You know, they're going crazy. And all these things happen. I'm like, yo, wait a minute. How, how can we actually be upset? Because we continue to hand over our traditional music to other people for their commercial gain. Like, mm. like by the time this dude won, people had moved on and was like, okay, what I would have just like they did with rhythm and blues or the early r and b or or, or or like they did with disco and soul all the way to the blues mm-hmm. because you find in the blues by the sixties this was a a a white white people were the ones going to these shows yeah mm. you know and and you hear in a lot of interviews from all the older legends how you know they looked in the crowd and they saw white faces and some didn't know how to handle some really was disappointed but they had to eat Hmm. you hear the same stories with all some of our legends in hip-hop now some of them but now in this day and age within the last 15 years maybe maybe 20 the game changed the business i hate to use that term the business has changed to the point where there's more ownership so with ownership, you know, you understand what's commercially viable and you understand that you want as much uh, money and sell as much of your product as possible. So you make a decision. But in those days, they weren't making those too many decisions. So mm-hmm. when all these things happen and, and, and I'm, you know, and I'm writing, I'm typing, you know, uh, I'm, I'm making articles, I'm interviewing people and, and my wife walks in and she goes, you know, um, you know that white guy, that old white guy who just likes interviewing old black guys? And I was like, yeah, she said, that's what you do. 
to folklore, she said, yeah. She said, because hmm. you, you know, she, then she used another example. She said, you know, like how we used to watch American Idol and they would always tell them, or if it's not one of those type of shows, I forgot the other one. She said, they would tell them, when you know who you are as an artist, you'll be better off. You don't know who you are as an artist, so it doesn't. She said, "You know who you are as an artist. You know what you, you know what you represent. Mm-hmm. You know what your, your your voice and mission is, and you're in the space of this guy. Get it together." Was pretty much what she said. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that was an epiphany moment, and that was kind of the birth of this entire platform, Jack Dapper Blues, talking about the blues, yeah. and, and me actually setting out to go out and play these original songs in a traditional style. Yeah. So wow. For the long answer. No, no, that's, I mean, it's, it's a helpful answer. You said, you said a bunch of things in there that are super interesting and I'm trying to decide on which, which one I want to, I want to pull on and ask you about, because you, I mean, you mentioned some things about black ownership and, you know, the first question that comes to mind, honestly, right. And, and this actually extends itself to what I do want to talk about. So we'll just go with the flow. You talked about you know, folks giving away uh, our ownership or giving away some of the, the, the things that we created when we move on from you know, R&B. And one of the, the first question I have is, is whether or not we give it away or, or, or if it's stolen. And I just mentioned this because I, I, I watched the, I, well, I listened to a podcast recently with Keith Urban, who's you know country singer from Australia yeah. and he moved here to Nashville. And he was saying that a lot of his heroes. Yeah, I'm sorry, uh, just, just, just. Did you hear what you said? Yeah. The countries. Yep. I yep. That says everything for me. But go ahead. <laughs> yeah. No. We'll see. We'll see. Here's the thing, right? He, he moved here from, from Australia, moved to Nashville, and he was saying that a lot of his, a lot of his influences were British guys who sang like Americans. And when he said this, I was like, what he's really trying to say is sing like black people. Because he's mentioning, you know, David Bowie, he's mentioning the Beatles, and they would talk one way when they introduced the song, and then when they started singing, they would sound another way. But that's because they were studying Muddy Waters, and they were listening to, you know, all of the Chuck Berries and the Rosetta Thorpe. They were listening to those folks. So I always wonder about the relationship between things being stolen and us giving things away, because I don't... I'm inclined to think that things get stolen and we have to figure something else out to do something new, which is not necessarily giving it away. It's just kind of being innovative and knowing how folks do our stuff. But then there's this question of like black ownership and where we are right now in our world and how at least maybe it's my generation, I'm not sure, but I feel like the, the presentation or the importance and significance of black ownership is rising is rising and rising and rising. So I'm curious as to, you know, what you think about black ownership and its relationship to keeping our stuff. But then, you know, when we can't, when we can't keep it and it, lo- and it becomes, no, it's no longer viable or somebody messed it up and we don't want to do that no more. <laughs> like if, if folks is, is just copying our stuff and they're not even doing it right, I'm going to just, just do something different. So, you know what I'm saying? It's like, what do we, what do, we do with that? Right. Um, that's a, a loaded question. It's a lot to unpack, but we, we, can, we, can, do, we can try. Yeah. Um, first and foremost, I'm pro black, dark, brown, brown, red, however you want to uh, <laughs> identify, right? Yes. People, ownership. Absolutely. I, I'm pro that. You know, I'm a big fan of Bowley, Oklahoma. Uh, mm. uh, the, the, you know, we can go down the list, but I, I'm I'm pro ownership. Absolutely, right. I'm I'm pro ownership. Yes, that's just a given. Um. So, he, here's the thing, right? I'll start with with John Wesley Work, the third. Um, we come from three generations of Fisk University, Fisk Jubilee. Uh, he folklorist, ethnographers, and what he did in his day was well, he had a, a I guess we could say an ideological conflict with uh, the, the Lomaxes. He worked with them, mm-hmm. but they wanted mm-hmm. to record and preserve black traditional music of old 
he wanted to record, document, and investigate <laughs> the progression of bl black traditional music. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I start with that because black expression evolves. Yes. For many reasons. It could be, you know, with, with lack of resource, you find a way to do something. Yeah. You could be trying to emulate something, but it gives it a different sound. You're like, oh, and then you mm -hmm. went with it. You know, mm -hmm. so that's, that's one. And then two, you know, the 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 systems divide of generations mm. kind of and this is my belief this is more my belief from what i've seen witnessed in in research because when you look at our our people and in different tribes and the different cultures of black because it's not just one monolithic culture or tribe mm -hmm. but the elder is always at the helm and and mm. those that come after is always for the most part looking working and willing to take the torch and carry it mm. in this system if commercially you can look at it and see that the wedge is well you don't want to hear your parents soul music mm. and that's how they pr promote mm. you know their 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 genres yeah so that's, that's real already, you know yeah. and then blues the term blues was given not because of the downtrodden that part of the blues was established after emancipation the original blues was made by free black folk and it was mm. just risk it was called blue because it was a play off the french term of uh, uh risky mm. okay, yeah so now you have these things where mm. you have uh, sexually uh, 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 influenced and suggestive lyrics and, and in some cases dance. Obviously, your parents don't want you involved in that. And that's something mm. that's long lasting, you mm. know, but they have something to sell. And, you know, I, 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 I can't let the kids off the hook. I was a kid. I, right. They don't want me to do this, but I want to do this. You know, so there, there's a whole bunch of nuances that make this a little convoluted. Now, as 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 more of getting to the point of being robbed, the appropriation, the assimilation. Yeah. I can't think of the guy's name. I, I shouldn't. I should remember his name, but he was out. And I believe Memphis. Uh, he's the guy who put Elvis and all these guys on, these white guys on. Okay. Now the first person, one of the first people he worked with, was 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 um 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 Ike Turner. Okay. Ike Turner was the first one to chart a rock record. Yes. Very first one. Mm. Ike Turner worked with this white dude. I can't think of his name. At uh, Sun Sun Records or Sun something like this, and he was they they were turning out many records and many black records. Ike was the the, the guy yeah. that everybody came through, right? Okay, mm -hmm. this white guy that he was working with was like you know, white people ain't buying these records. You, you know, white people will not buy these records, yeah, because you know it's race music. Mm -hmm. He wanted to tap into the white uh, dollar. Yes. So he decides, I'm going to get me a, a, a white boy that like this music. Mm -hmm. and, and so so now, is that appropriation? Is is that just the capital? A capital well, better yet, let me ask a better question. Yeah. Yeah. Is that racist or is that just a capitalist move? Ha! Well, you know... The two are, are inextricably linked, so <laughs> it can be both. Usually when a thing is racist, it's also capitalist. Usually when a thing is capitalist, it's also racist. So, you know, that's the, it's a good question though, right? Because, right. because but, what you, what you, go ahead, go ahead. No, I was going to say, on the other hand, you have somebody like um, John Dolphin. John mm -hmm. Dolphin mm -hmm. predates 
Barry Gordy. Matter of fact, Barry mm. Gordy got his entire blueprint from John Dolphin. Mm. Now, John Dolphin, a black man from Bowley, Oklahoma, mm. right, mm-hmm. who understood black ownership, goes to mm. Central Avenue, makes a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week record store, has a vision to put a radio station in a front window mm. and get white, black, and Chicano uh, 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 pe- people to host these shows. Mm. So now his radio program introduces black music to white audiences who used to frown upon it because mm. now ultimately his record store becomes the hub for all young teeny boppers or whatever you call it and, and even older music enthusiasts. Right. So now you, you have this entire space of black businesses being patronized mm. by black, white, and Chicano people. Wow. Yeah. Of the coalition. Co- no. it, yeah. Right. Right. Now, so so now we you know we, we have to when we look at these things, mm. right, we, we have to look at it with two lenses. We have to look at it logically on both ends. We can't look at it emotionally. And we have to look at it in regards to a business and a business owner and in regards to is is someone conducting unscrupulous if i said that right business practices mm-hmm. yeah right because this goes back to menstruals oh yeah it does menstruals wow yeah was was how black people ate who were great musicians performers. Great, yep. great performers yep so so now you, you look at menstruacy and, and everybody is in shell shock and disturbed from these grotesque caricatures. Mm. But if, if you look at comedy, even till to, until this day, how else were they able to reflect society to make you see how nasty these people are mm-hmm. when they don't show you these characters? Mm. So these are political statements. Not all, there was some that was used for propaganda don't get me wrong and then you have other moments again i forget this brother's name but he was big in coon shouting he wrote coon songs Mm. right this was a thing yeah and i mean that's ah yeah and that that happened in so many different genres right i mean even like you know in poetry follow on dunbar had dialect poem and that's what that's what helped sell so you have this difficulty of like you, like you identify, right? Folks who are performers, musicians, artists, literature folks, entertainers, this is how they eat. But also the way that they, the way that they have access to eating requires a performance in a way that's not necessarily ideal. So now you have this like dilution of the, of, of the experience and of what is being created and shared because of the commercial value of these things. And it's a it's a it's a catch twenty two absolutely, and I would love to hear from you. Right, you've mentioned this is like you said this is a heavy topic. This is a thing that probably could be a long, super long conversation. Papers and dissertations have been written about this, uh, but I'm curious of about I'm, I'm curious about what you think. One, and then we'll go again. We'll we'll go to another point here. I'm curious about what you think about the relationship between being a business person and being an artist. Because clearly, right, as a producer and a content person, you have to do both. You have to, in, you have to engage with all these different areas. But where do, they, where do they collide? Where do they overlap? What's the, what's the relationship between the business, being a business person, being an artist? Hey, that's... Um a unique uh, relationship Um, because it could break you to the point where you don't want to express art anymore. Mm. It can also break you to the point where it makes you heartless. Mm. Right? 
Ah, yeah. So it, you, it, as you know, you, you're an artist, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it's a fine line and it, it all depends. It, it depends on a lot. It depends on a lot. That's really a hard one for me um, being grounded in the most high and, and yes. being raised to, to go to God first. You know, yeah. There was a meme that was circulating around some years ago. If you had to sin to receive it, it wasn't a blessing. Hmm. And I hmm. don't remember many memes, but that one has made it to not just my wall, but the front of my head. Hmm. So when you're conducting, when I'm conducting business and as an artist, you give, you, you have to allow yourself to be vulnerable so the people could feel you mm. and what you're saying. You know, it's a difference to hear someone who's trained hit every note for two hours than hear someone who may be singing off key, but you're feeling everything they're saying. That's a big difference. Mm. You know, and, and it's not easy to allow yourself to be that vulnerable. But then after mm. the, when you're conducting the business, you just have to be able to separate it. You have to understand that the creation is where the emotions and the passion is. The business, you leave that, you leave that out. Because yeah. half the time, you know, majority of people in general, in my experience, were, were never looking to hurt me personally per se mm -hmm. business business deals is okay who i'm going to make sure i get the best out of this deal and some people may just be a little bit selfish sometimes you have to be selfish but if, if you understand not to take everything as a personal assault mm -hmm. or an attack you i believe you can navigate it especially if you have um a a, a foundation a strong foundation you, you can navigate pretty well. I hope that answers your question. No, it does. And, you know, this this is where I wanted to get to as well, right? Like hearing from you about some of the specific obstacles you faced, especially in, in the industry space where you have to think about business, but you're also a person who wants to be vulnerable. You're also an artist. You also care about the, you know, keenly care. You keenly care about the con content that is being shared and the stories that are being told. You have identity wrapped up in this. It's not just a thing, it's not just a discipline. It's right. not just a thing you study. So there's obstacles that come along with that. Especially, you know, your person who's achieved some great things, right? So right. what are some of the obstacles though uh, that, you, that you've experienced in this space? And, and what are the ways, you mentioned your foundation, but what are some of the ways that, that you've got over some of the obstacles? Well, the first obstacle in this particular space mm -hmm. was the confrontation that I used to get from uh, tenured, older white academics, majority male, uh, sometimes female, but I, I think that percentage was more the aggressive verbiage I used. Um, mm. When I say aggressive verbiage, I don't mean uh, cursing or name calling, but more or less, you know, this is mine, this ain't yours, get out of here. <laughs> you know. And so what, what happens is because, mm. you know, I was they, they would they I was being accosted and they was, you know, questioning my valid my valid validity, excuse me. Mm -hmm. You know, pretty much saying, Who are you? Who do you think you are coming in here? You know, and and, and really trying to tell me how this works. And when I say how this works, not the academic space but how blues people work, how mm. the music work, what it really represented, what these people really meant, how they really live, all this kind of stuff they were trying to tell me in a way that wasn't necessarily us building on different uh, uh, theologies, ideologies, or, 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 or school of thought. Right, it was a difference. Mm. It was more of a who are you get out of here. Now, this is not all because there mm. were some that I, I spoke to on the side. They were encouraging, and they gave me the space to use their platforms mm. to 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 share my works and, and and address these things. Right. 
So that that's the, the first thing. And and mm. I took it really personal. Yeah. I took yeah. it because here it is, you're getting fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth hand information, and you're telling mm. me about something that I literally grew up in my entire life. Right. Right. So I, I had a, so the way I initially handled it to answer your question without I, I, I had a point to prove. Mm -hmm. And what ended up happening, more importantly, with the encouragement of family, you know, my wife, my mother, mm -hmm. friends, whatever like this, and just mature and then interviewing people and and building relationships and just listening, I I, I more specifically ran into a gentleman named wow. Tony Thomas. Mm. Um, I don't even know. I hope he's listening. I have to tell him this because I don't even know if he knows his statement mm. helped mature my handling of the situation mm. and how I approach this entire field. Mm. He is a banjo expert amongst mm. other things. Yeah. And in our interview, I'm trying to get him to just say the banjo is black and it comes from Africa. And I believe he knew that's what I was trying to get him to say and he refused to say it. And he eventually explains its origin and then follows up with this piece of information. He said, when you want to learn, and he didn't say, I'm telling you this, he didn't put it that way. He just said it knowing that if I was ready to receive it, because you have to be ready to receive information. Mm -hmm. He says to me, when you are earnestly looking for the truth, you have to go in blank. You cannot go in with preconceived notions. You cannot go into it with an agenda to prove your theory correct, because mm -hmm. it's really easy to find confirmations of your belief but if you want to actually find the truth go in with a blank slate and be open to the evidence mm. that matured me as a folklorist as an ethnographer mm. because what happens is outside of a, a friend of mine telling me you have an opportunity to to bridge the gap bring people together by allowing uh, one group of people to understand another group of people and vice versa. But I was able to process what Tony Thomas said is why am I working to prove these, you know, why am I working to prove, why do I have a point to prove if my, my, my calling is to present information to give proper context? I don't have a point to prove. I have a mission that I have to respect because if I get something incorrect, I mean, if I do, I just say, you know, sorry, let's, let's, let, let me figure it out. But yeah. I, 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 I have, I ha people come to my platforms because they trust what I'm telling them. And if I have yeah. a point to prove, I could be missing so many things mm. and I could be giving people misinformation. And there's one thing that I have a problem with is all these people spewing misinformation. Yeah. And, I'll, and I will be in that, in that circle. So that's yeah. how I dealt with it. You know, I was, you know, I received, I listened, and I tried to apply all these things. And then it, it kind of uh, matured me, you know, mm -hmm. into to not trying to prove white people wrong as a whole, mm -hmm. not trying to prove black people right, mm -hmm. but just trying to present the proper context and hopefully giving everybody a little bit more understanding of how this stuff happened and works. Yeah. Thank you I for that. answered your question. No, yeah, now this is great. This is amazing. You know, you just mentioned being matured in a way from some advice and some colleagues. And you know, there may be some folks watching this now, hopefully even folks watching this later who are trying to figure out what they want to be doing with the things they're passionate about. And one of the things I love to do is think about people's interest areas from a different angle. So a lot of times when people hear content or music, they think of a particular lane. They think of being an artist on the stage, they think of playing a specific instrument. But you mentioned being a folklorist 
in being an ethnographer. And you know, as we start to kind of wrap up the convo, I would love for you to kind of give us a working definition of what those two things are. Again, this is for folks who may be tuning in, who are searching for what they're passionate about, or maybe even folks who got some younger folks in their life who you know, want to be giving them some advice or imparting some wisdom. So this may be a new term or new areas of, of skills for folks. So I would love for you to give us a working definition of what a folklorist is, what an ethnographer actually is. And then it'd be great for you to share with us any advice you would have for folks who want to get into these spaces of music, of the academic side of it, of performing itself? Um, great question. And that's uh, something that, uh, one of the reasons why the, I, I created the African American folklorists, which was to bridge the gap between the academia lane and the layperson's lane. Mm -hmm. and, 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 I myself is not doing it by myself, but it, these things um, allowed me to meet great people of mm. many walks of life that were all trying to work to bring independent community laypersons and academia together and, mm. and mm -hmm. to work together because it's a big difference to be in the institution and then to be on the street with the folk, yep. to be able to folk. You know. yep. um, folklore is man as general as, how can i say as a general as a, it is legend is myth mm -hmm. it's um uh narrative it's material items uh and it's the, and, and the folklore studies researches these these things and the stories nutrition traditions that go along with it to, to put it as as uh, basic as possible ethnography uh, an ethnographer, I, I guess that would, not I guess, but the best way to put that as basic as possible is, I, I guess, the function you use in studying this and documenting this, right? So I would be considered a folklorist because I study the folklore, the traditions and the heritage of my own people. Mm -hmm. I'm an ethnographer because I document these histories, these traditions. Yes. Um, as 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 in my so i started as as, as you guys could tell based on what i started as an independent i, I didn't know i was a folklorist and mm. in, in, in interviewing uh black folklorists majority even white ones for that matter just period folklorist period majority of them that i spoke to majority of us didn't realize that was what we were doing mm. um I, I, I took to Alan Lomax and John Wesley Works, like I said, and my wife said, you do what they do. And that's how I identified it. I just kept working hard and um, uh, the most high put me in different positions where I met different people like a Simon Bonner, who um, just, volunteered. you know, he saw an article of mine in Living Blues, reached out to me and was like, hey man, and we began talking and he helped guide me to the American Folklore Society and mm -hmm. I ended up going to um, the Baltimore conference last year and giving a presentation. That led to a whole bunch of things and, mm -hmm. and that led to me going back to this one. Why I'm in Kentucky is because I'm mm -hmm. here at Western Kentucky University, which has if not the best, one of the best folklore masters programs. Mm -hmm. You know, so I can so so I can get my master's, PhD, and then teach African American folklore. Nice, right? Um, I would like those of you who are passionate about storytelling, your story, someone else's story about traditions and things of this nature, just keep doing it. Mm. One, um, two. Find um, folklore, traditional arts, ethno ethnomusicology. Uh, find groups that that uh, highlight these things and chat people up. Because what will happen is you may not have a clear vision of what you want to do with your passion or, or whatever it may be. When I say whatever it may be, 
obviously it's a passion, but you you may be making something that you have no idea the worth of it. It could be a quilt, it could be something out of wood, mm. poem, whatever. You know, you may not understand the value. You connect with people who, whether they do it for a living or or however, they may be able to help um, construct your 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 vision in a way that you can actually uh, give back, make a living out of it mm -hmm. and while you're preserving uh, yours or someone else's uh, history and tradition. Wow. You know, mm -hmm. because for me, I, 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 you know, I know so many guys and, 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 and women that don't even realize they're folklorists and ethnographers. And they're out here interviewing and doing this and, and preserving hip hop and preserving this and preserving mm. that. And, and they, you know, they're interviewing people in the community and they're documenting it. And, and these are the people that academia needs to go to and partner with, you know. And, and a lot of times you don't, I know for me, I never knew this was a, a viable uh, uh, career. Right. You know, and and um, when I set out to do these things, I was my career was in broadcasting, mm. so it was just uh, uh, it just made sense to utilize broadcasting to to, to platform these stories. So the point I'm making is right. there's just right. so many people in 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 these communities, low to no communities or what have you, that don't even understand that their passion. Could actually uh, translate into a viable career. That's that's yeah. the point. Long short. Yeah. No. Thank you. Thank you for for sharing that point. And again, storytellers, and we're all about preserving history and culture here at American Legacy Network. So Definitely. we're grateful to have you as a as a partner and as a producer here. And for folks, you know, for jo who joined in, thank you so much for joining us for this conversation. This has actually been really, really insightful and helpful. And, and and I'm, I'm charged up a little bit, you know, as a, as a fellow artist and as a producer, uh, you know, check out these, these, this content. Check out Jack Dabber, Jack, Jack uh, the Blues Radio. Check out Talking About the Blues. Make sure you have signed up for American Legacy Network if you have not already. Where else can we find you, Jack? Where else can we find you out there? Google Jack Dabba Blues. <laughs> <laughs> Google um, Jack Dabba Blues. <laughs> yeah, you'll find it everywhere. Uh, I, I would tell everybody also, you know, go to the African American Folklorist website, uh, subscribe, get the newspaper. It's quarterly, and yeah. it, it just it, it just shares uh, black folk folklore and, and, mm. and everything behind it. Yeah. Um, definitely subscribe to American Legacy, which honors me by platforming and, and, and streaming some of my work. You yes. know, and anybody else that's there. Yes. You know, I, I just, just a quick little story. The mm -hmm. irony, if you really want some irony. Yeah, give it to me. I, you know, my mother came, this is like 20 something years ago, man. I came in the house and <laughs> you know, I got a magazine for you. She ordered it as a present for, for my birthday. Wow. And it was American Legacy. Wow. So I, it, you know, so I've, I have a collection <laughs> of these magazines and then I meet a good uh, colleague and a very brilliant woman, Keisha, um, uh, Keisha Gay Anderson. And she's like, okay. hey, Jack, you know, um, American Legacy is looking for some content. And I was like, and I was like, wow, why does this sound familiar? Mm. And she introduced me to your father and I was like, yo, and you can ask them. I'm sure I'm like, look, I got your stuff. <laughs> <laughs> full circle, full circle. That's right. That's That's right. right. And, but we need these platforms, right? These platforms are necessary. The creators on these platforms are necessary. So thank you for being a creator. Thank you for sticking to your story. And I'm glad you found them blues, man. I'm glad you found it. It's always in the rhythms, you know what I'm saying? So again, we appreciate you and we're, we're grateful for the conversation tonight. Check us out, subscribe, follow us, do all of those things. Mega Legacy Network. This is the Mutual Producer. Stay tuned with more things coming down the pipe. So please make sure that you are tuned in to all the things that are coming. And again, thank you. So thank you so much. All right. And everybody else, have a great evening. Blessings to you all. And uh, peace and power to you. All right. Next time. Peace, peace, y'all. <laughs>